Hello, welcome to lecture number three. This is Dr. Robert O. Let's share the screen and then we'll start with prayer, shall we? Let us pray. Father, we come to you in reverence and fear, knowing that you are the one who actually makes the final call on our ministry, our mission. Help us, Lord, to, uh, to do it humbly, with right attitude, they will not become proud in what we do, but in humility, seeking mercy of God each day. For without you, there's nothing we can do. Holy Spirit, God, teach us, guide us. Let it, this teaching be revelatory that we may learn something, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Paksu, as uh, we continue to review, we talked about the basic patron-client dynamic or kapbenur relationship, uh, how I always play the role of patron and central peace and house of peace uh, would play the role of client. But it's not as regimented or clear cut like a box, but it's more congru congruent. They're kind of mixed together. This will be the more Asian understanding this will be more of the Western understanding of patron client, kind of boxed and analytical and divided. Uh, but this is more like all kind of together. <laughs> uh, and we went through uh, 10 characteristic of patron client relationship in social anthropology study. Mm -hmm. And I asked the um, following question that was my research question. How many characteristics are in between Robert and Bopar as the representative of patron or cop, Bopar as a representative of client? Uh, there are 10 characteristics. Uh, is it dyadic? Does it involve two people? Is it asymmetrical? Is there a hierarchical? Is it personal and enduring? Is it reciprocity? Is there a give and take? Uh, is it voluntary? Is it forced or not? Duration of bond, is it long or short? Scope of exchange, is it deep and wide or is it shallow and narrow? Resource base, uh, is it from outside or is it from within? Local resource control, once resource is in, who controls the resource? Is it patron or the super god? Density of coverage, does it deal with just few items as a project or as a whole? And I found that on all of them, uh, my relationship with Central Peace, especially Bopar, has covered. So I could uh, confidently say that my relationship with COP, HOP, and all the clients, including Bopar as a representative head, has been patron client, or in Korean sociological context, the solid cup and a relationship has been established. Now, once we establish that, then I have to ask the following question. Was it sort of like what happened between Ted and CBC pastors? For CPTI students, it was our first lecture, 20 weeks of it, and we covered it. And I said that the key findings uh, of my research was that Ted, play the role of patron as a father, okay? And then when, especially in the early stage of their mission, uh, something like eight, not eight, you know, eight uh, sort of like orphans live with them. And so obviously he played, had to play the role of father, right? And then we talked about how dependency level or shift from father role as a protector giving protection, huge, huge dependency issue. And that was not unhealthy dependency, it was healthy dependency for child needs to depend on parents. And then Ted moved from being a father to sponsor as the group began 100 member Bible college. And they said, okay, well, I cannot father 100 children. So naturally he became a patron as a sponsor. And so as they move the shift of the role, the role more became a provisional, uh, not protection. And then uh, they never moved to this stage, but they are now ready to move to partnership. But 
because Ted never envisioned this or never specced it in, in the blueprint, they never reached that goal. And they stuck after 15 years, patron as father, pay sponsor, and they're ready, so ready to move on to partnership uh, because uh, the client has reached their mid forties, early forties and mid forties, and they want to become independent. But they too are not ready because all the funding are still coming from Ted. Uh, without Ted's funding, their ministry, most of them will collapse. So they're at a the very peculiar, very difficult situation right now. So then I asked the following question. Is my relationship between Robert as the cop uh, and Bopar as Ur, is it really father relationship? Then move on to sponsor and to partner? I wonder, no, really. I said, now this is a post PhD question. And this is wonderful because what you get out of PhD research is not that you wrote a thesis. That's not that important, actually. This is just a byproduct. The most important aspect of your PhD or master thesis is that did you learn how to do research at that level, right? Master level research is master level. PhD research is PhD level. So from this point forward, after I got my PhD from 1918, Everything that I've done afterwards is PhD level research. And so now I wrote a book through Regnum, it's published, but now I'm looking at my own ministry. This is very important. I'm looking at my uh, projects that I've done at uh, Cambodia, five, six, seven of them. One of them is Central of Peace. Now I'm looking and objectively asking the following question. What about between Bopar and Robert? Did I really play the father, sponsor? or partner? And the answer is no. No, that's not what happened. See, unlike Ted and CBC, my relationship looks very similar as Cambodian t-shirt says, same, same, but different, right? Same, same, but different. Have you seen that t-shirt? They're actually a movie called Same, Same, But Different uh, for Cambodian. You know, Cambodian girl falls in love with some European boy, uh, same, same, but different. Uh, Check it out, there's a movie. Anyways, uh, when I make an observation, looking at the data, looking at all my files that I accumulated, uh, starting from COP, uh, I look at the New Life uh, Student Center, I look at all the files, personal history, starting from Bopar and everyone else. And then I have a COP file, that is huge file and all the people, all the documentation, uh, all the review, the, the project development center of peace, looking at their funding. I mean, we have a 14 years of history of receiving the budget projection. Talking about their theme. and how I became a patron and support them through uh, Korean churches. How I, re how I requested um, Central Peace to come up with the planning. So teaching them how to raise fund. My personal meeting notes with Bopar, uh, when we start supporting the rice, how we're gonna do it, and who's gonna sponsor, okay? 2012 notes on electricity, running water, how much of it is responsible, who's gonna take care. Uh, the birthday celebration, we started uh, January 2012-13, Who's gonna take care of that? Uh, we're taking care of uh, sports equipment, badminton set, uh, water electricity bill, once again. Uh, uh, supporting Bopar's MBA program, 2012. Who's gonna support that and who's gonna pay for it? Okay. 2010, uh, scholarship program, and who's gonna be in charge? How the finance gonna come through? 
2010 COP issues, uh, visiting Bopar, Jenny, uh, this type following issue. Um, boy, 2009, how 5,000 was given and how we was relocated so that you will not be used right away, but you saved it for future project. That's how we have agreed upon. Um, we had to, we hired a nurse, a full-time nurse, and we spent thousand dollars hiring a nurse so that this nurse will come to COP and actually take a, a survey and then did. And we took care of all the 81 kids list at their age. Um, and then we start doing a Excel sheet spreadsheet of who's taking care of who and what is in place expenditure January 2011. February, March, April, the whole year, ex expenditure sheet. Okay, why am I bothering you with all this? It wasn't a simple task. It's very time consuming, right? Meeting after meeting after meeting uh, and reviewing people's file, okay? Make sure that we have the right people, right? But at the beginning stage, my role was not a father. I play the role of sponsor as cop. I understand cop and the relationship. I was cop as a sponsor. Popar was Ul as a sponsoree. Okay. And then funny thing happened. Something happened in uh, COP. Not by my design. I didn't plan it. It was not part of my strategy. But I need to step up as a sponsor. Uh, to become a father. And I did not plan it that way. Uh, so when I became a sponsor. Let's not talk about father yet. Let's talk about cop as sponsor. So I'm a sponsor because I had no intention of becoming their sponsor. But 2007, I get a house right there, at, right below about three streets away from Turtupong, Russian market. And when I moved in 2007, I basically uh, inherit their ministry because COP was right in front of my house. <laughs> and I was like, why are they so noisy? You know, because every morning I try to have a quiet time, drink my coffee, you know. And it's so noisy. I walked in and he was like, what? There's so many kids around. I said, well, what's going on? They said, well, it's orphanage. The reason I got a house there, because I had a salt and light bookstore for close to 10 years. Now, that's another ministry that I'm going to talk about and talk about carpenter relationship. So that's another major thing that I've done close to plus 15 years. So I'm going to talk about that, or 10 years. I'm going to talk about that. But because I had a salt and light bookstore there, I rent a flat around the corner. It so happened, COP was there. And of course, they moved three times or four times from that point. But I think it was God. You know, it's God who put us together, right? So I played the role as a cop because God put me there. <laughs> and oh boy, I met them. It was so right here, this house right here, you see that right here? That was my flat that I was renting. And right across, so many kids. At the time, 82 kids. Well, it says 2008, but actually uh, misspelled or typo. It's 2007. Uh, and at the time, uh, it, my ministry in America was not called life-giving ministry. It was called Vision to Reality, P2R. So Vision to Reality, we raised a lot of money and start supporting. And Director Bopar was so cute, much younger. Her daughter, Diamond, right? Adopted daughter. So 
Yeah, so it was public information, so I'm sharing it publicly. I'm trying to keep it uh, private if this is a private information, but this was all public. Uh, and that was my website, and that's how I raised funding, right? So people could play the slideshow play or subscribe, and then, and then you link uh, to blesscambodia.com. And then they could give easily through credit card and then whatever money I collect, then I took a control and then used it for COP. Now, there is a positive and negative aspect of me playing the role as a cop, as a sponsor. Now, this is not right and wrong. This is just my personal understanding. After doing this for 14 years, and these are more the personal understanding and uh, thought. So don't, don't quote me as it's right or wrong response. No, it's just my personal. Uh, what is positive? Well, I was so happy that I found Bopar and Central Peace. Why? Because it was a wonderful, wonderful orphanage. Because I also found, um, you know, <laughs> I've been to many countries, 64 countries to be more exact. And then guess what? I visited a lot of orphanages all over the world. Some of the orphanages are horrible situation. It's run by a terrible people. You know, I, I, to say very lightly, they are criminals, they are crooks. You know, and they run as like money, they get, get money. And that's why the Cambodia government had to shut down a lot of these orphanages because there are a lot of abuse, right? Uh, just my personal experience of orphanages. You know, uh, I was talking to very well respected Cambodian pastor who had uh, six orphanages and I end up visiting their orphanages too. It's beautifully run. Kids are taken care, you know, uh, father and mother relationship. They actually have a live-in uh, director who takes care of the children. Not too many, you know, because you, you cannot have too big of an orphanage. You know, it's like COP is exceptional. You don't really have that big of an orphanage. So smaller number, maybe 20, 30. So I start visiting these orphanages all over Cambodia. Uh, it's good. And the six orphanages, I think I visited two or three of this orphanage is it? it's run by a very well-respected pastor who doesn't you know, rob the children's future by taking the money and use it for themselves. No, it's just really, and it's also connected with local church so that these children are, their spiritual needs are taken care. Fantastic, I, you know. But uh, this pastor comes to me and says, Pastor O, I am ready to shut down probably five out of the six orphanages we're running. I said, why? Well, this American missionary came. Oh, did I say American? I shouldn't say American. Uh, this uh, Western missionaries came and uh, he contacted all my orphanage directors and said, how much do you get paid? I said, well, you know, hundred dollars, you know, but they get to live there no lodging, housing, food, everything they carry. They just to live with, you know, 15 or 20 orphans. So, and so, you know, wife could do that and husband could take a job. So that was pretty fair at the time. This is, you know, you know 15 years ago. Now, no, <laughs> it's too little. But 15 years ago, yeah, you, know, you get to live there, eat food and, you know, just one person could be in director and, you know, husband could work. So that was good setup. But this uh, Western missionary came because he's into orphanage business. He said, well, how much do you get paid? Well, $100. I'll give you $100, $300 now in cash. So come out of that orphanage, you know, just about a month later, come out. I'll pay you $150 or $200. So they negotiate like a co social contract. It's not patron. It's a social contract, you know capitalistic contract, business marketing contract. But don't come out, you know, then it will be not nice that you jump from that, that pastor's, Cambodia pastor's orphanage to our orphanage right away. So take one month break, take a vacation. 
but I'll pay you 200 a month. Wow. How can anybody say no to that, <laughs> right? Double your salary, take a one month vacation, but you come and work for my orphanage. And that's what they did. So he, I think he lost like all the five directors at the same time, because the other director, it was very personal level, so it's okay. It's terrible, isn't it? How uh, we can, as a Christian, so-called doing ministry, and use it as a means uh, to make money. And this is the crazy part of this orphan uh, business, orphanage business, and these directors, these crooks, these criminals, they're going to now recruit money from all over the world, saying that, oh, sponsor this baby, just $30, and we'll take care of them. And then you triple, quadruple. You know, Not only you get support for one child, one child, you get support from five people. So now you make 150 per child, but you only spend 30. So who makes who? Who uses the difference? I mean, these are the criminal cases. These are the terrible orphanage cases. That's why Cambodia government wants to shut down a lot of these orphanages. So much abuse. Okay. So don't don't be naive. Don't be don't be a fool. These so-called practice has been done among Christians, Christian orphanages. You know, there are some. Uh, people who's making a lot of money. Okay. So guess what? Month later, uh, all these directors come back to my friend pastors and says, hey, uh, we don't have any orphans in our orphanages. <laughs> Can you give us some orphans? <laughs> Can you give us? That's so sad. So terrible. So I asked him, so what did you do? How would you respond to that? They say, well, I don't have control over this. And, you know, it's relationship between the director and the children. So we ask the children, if you consider that director as your father figure and you love them and have a love relationship, then by all means go. So they basically shut down five orphanages so that they could go and start this orphan orphanages. And guess what? Government shuts them down eventually all of them. That's kind of crazy you know, because of that kind of abuse. But at that moment, 2007, finding a good client, good orphanage to me was the great positive thing because now I could really invest in these orphanages because what happened was that when I went, I walked in, you know, actually I walked in uninvited because they were so noisy and I said, Whew, what is this place? I opened the door, walked in, 82 kids running around in this big house. I'm like, Whew, what is this? And then I thought, oh, they must be running orphanages. So I start taking pictures as a good tourist or as a good, you know, not thinking person would do. Bupar walks, to, walks up to me and said, why are you taking a picture of my children? I said, oh, isn't this orphanage? She said, no, don't call it orphanage. It's called center of peace. <laughs> and she said, she basically told me, don't turn my children into a product for your promotion. Because I guess she got hurt by some not so smart missionaries. Try to tell them to help, but then they raise money for themselves, acting like they're helping COP. So she was very like standoffish. She said, please, you know, what, what are you doing? Why are you taking picture of my children? <laughs> I actually fell in love with her because of that. I said, wow, now this is a director. This is a director who I could really trust because she refused to use children to, to get funding or you know, to have false identity. See, it has happened over and over again all over the world. I was in Kenya, I was in Africa. And I was talking to visiting orphanages and drinking tea and talk about orphanages. And, you know, this Korean missionary in Kenya, Africa, was sharing with me, you know, Pastor O, for like five, six years, um, some mission agency in America came worldwide. I mean, there, if I mention the name, you'll know. This worldwide mission agency from America. And, you know, so for some strange reason, this 
guy would come and take picture of all my children for like four or five years. Finally, I had to stop them. I said, stop. Why are you taking take picture of my children? You know, individually, especially. Stop. I would not allow you to do that. And then they said, oh, then we have a problem. Why? Because guess what they've been doing? They've been collecting money on each child, you know, $30 per child for many years. Wow, horrible. These are Christian criminals at work. And this is supposed to be Christian organization. And I'm not saying it's happening all over the world. I'm just saying that in Kenya, it happened for five years. Oh, Lord, help us. I don't know where they stand before God. <laughs> I don't even think they'll go to heaven, you know, these criminals selling name of Jesus, but they're just wolves in sheep's clothing. But Par wasn't. She said, why are you taking picture? I said, oh, I'm so sorry. I'll not take picture. And so I was so happy that I found a very, very, very good uh, orphanage. Now, this is years of years of visiting the wrong orphanages. And I know when I find a good one, <laughs> legitimate one. And then that gave me 2007 legitimacy in being in Cambodia. Now, as a missionary, if I don't have any mission project, mission work, why am I there to make a living? No, I don't want to live in Cambodia if I don't have a God's mission. If God doesn't give me a project to do, then why would I? I, read that I, I want to be in Hawaii. You know, honestly, I think if you ever visit Hawaii, all of the Cambodian people will live in Hawaii. Why would you want to live in Cambodia? You know, hot and humid and, oh, you know, Hawaii is nicely, pleasantly warm and dry and whew. So the positive aspect of finding uh, COP was hmm, I found legitimacy, meaning that there was a good reason. Now people who sponsor me will say, oh, okay, well, you're doing mercy ministry. See, that was my third point, mercy project. Good news to my cop, because I also have a patron. I have my sponsor who supports me, right, for 20 plus years. Now I could, because, you know, most of the mission work, they like mercy ministry. They like to support orphanages. They don't want to support research projects. They don't want to give money to, you know, buy, you know, um, when I say that, oh, I need to publish a book, no one will support. Most of publishing book, I had to do it on my, with my own money. But when I say that, oh, I like to support orphanages, they said, oh, good, how much? <laughs> so that was a pretty good uh, positive thing as a, a sponsor. You know, I'm, I'm trying to be brutally honest with you. you know, I'm trying to be honest. I don't want to, you know, put a fake facade and mask and act like so spiritual. No, I'm going to be very brutally honest. And that's how at least me as a missionary has been feeling. Yeah, it's good to have mercy ministry under my belt. Why? Because so that I could raise money and, and, and also give legitimacy people, you know. And, and the thing about raising money, I do not take any percentage. So if someone gives me $100 for COP, Central Peace, then I'll give $100. I don't take, you know, usually certain agency will take 19% to 12%. $100 for a project, $100 goal. So I don't make any money. So I have very confident they say that I did not take, I did not make living by helping COP. So it was all positive. What was the negative aspect? Well, dealing with the cultural barrier. I am Korean American. Bopar was Cambodian Cambodian. I am male. She's a female. I am from America. She's from Cambodia. I am a doctorate. She's, she's from, uh, at the time, bachelor. You know, the orphanages, I am not an orphan. I didn't have to deal with orphans. So this huge cultural barrier, right? Because if I actually deal with RUPP graduate level student, that's less cultural barrier to break. Similar education background, similar social standing, similar economic standing. But now this is the lowest rank in the, uh, in the economic st structure. So there was a huge cultural barrier, socio, economic, gender, political, I mean, just huge. 
Second, uh, how do you help orphanage without causing dependency? The huge question. Because the whole thing of BAM, business as mission, they said that a dependency is wrong, you need to overcome. And so at the time, not now, I have different view, but at the time, huge responsibility set in. How do I help this orphanage without causing dependency? Well, later I found out you cannot do it, but at least at the time it was very, very negative that I have to process. And now, now that I got a client, guess what? The well, negative aspect of it is that I need money for that. I can't because I didn't have money. I did not have you know tens of thousands of dollars because that's how eventually it became. Yearly, I spent several tens of thousands of dollars per year uh, running this project. And that's just one of the projects out of six, seven projects that I was doing. So, wow, how do I come up with that? Now, if cop, me as a cop, as a sponsor has positive and negative aspect, Popar as a ur or client also as a sponsor has positive and negative aspect. That's, it's always both ends. It's never one-sided. It's very important. So as I look at my uh, ministry or mission work with COP, Central Peace, for the last 14 years, uh, this must what Bopar must went through. Now, uh, I'm going to invite Bopar uh, when we have our lecture series and let her talk, honestly. But this is my understanding. So this is not right and wrong. I'm not saying it's right and wrong. No, this is how I project that Bopar must felt looking back at 2007 as, as who she is, not who she is now. Who she is now is like, you know, married to American missionary and she has an American citizen. No, no, I'm talking about Bopar as a young lady, right? A single woman with 82 children to take care of how she must feel as a sponsoree. Sponsoree means I am a sponsor. Whoever I sponsor is called sponsoree. So Bopar as Ur as a sponsoree, positive thing is what? Well, welcome to financial stability because I start paying for children's school, you know, uniform, which she couldn't even afford. Um, and rice, Right, so that was financial stability. I mean, money was coming in regularly. So COP had a little more stability monthly. New projects were possible, for example, school uniform. You know, my wife said, hey, let's not just sponsor them like rice and things like that monthly. Why, why don't we ask uh, Popar what she really wants? So this was a very moving story, actually. So she asked Popar as a younger sister, Popar, what breaks your heart? He said, well, Pastor Jenny or Jenny, Pastor Jenny, I, I, it, it breaks my heart as a mother figure to these children. And we send them through all this public school. And uh, public school requires a school uniform. It's, you know, white, basic white. Um, and then they embroil their name. And they need two set because you know once gets dirty, you need to wash, hang up, and then they were two set. Uh, that's 160 unit uh, uniform embroiling cost. I don't know, two thousand five hundred to three thousand. Well, from Bopar's perspective, because Pastor Jenny said, "Oh, I'll take care of that." Well, school uniform project has begun, and once you start, you cannot stop, right? Well, and then special meal, like example, I would give $100 Wednesday or Thursday morning and, and time to time would we'll celebrate with chicken and Coke and kids have a wonderful time. So what's the positive aspect from Bopar's perspective as sponsoree? What, what would be the negative thing? Well, of course, dependency may set in from the get-go, from the very beginning. It may, it has not yet there's a possibility of dependency could set in. And that's quite negative. You don't want that. And possibility of kapjil from new cop, which will be me, because she does not know me. She just began. And she must have also bad experience with Korean missionaries, 
American missionaries, missionaries in period, rich Cambodian person. It doesn't matter whoever becomes your patron, right? Because yeah, with the whole idea of being a patron, the possibility of that patron or cop start acting like patronizing or cop jil. That was pretty negative stuff. She doesn't know. She does. She just met me, and she doesn't know who I am. And this crazy guy start taking pictures the first day. So she said, "Distance. I want to make sure that Pastor O is someone that I could trust." Right. So she kept the distance. That's negative. And as she adds a new sponsor, it will take time away from ministry to keep relationship with me as a patron. You know, because I'm demanding. Reports, meeting notes, right? right? Meeting notes, and oh, this is 2009 meeting notes, right? Okay. Wow, I even uh, bought a vitamins, $2,000 worth of vitamins. And how do you supplement the vitamins? How do we deworm them? So I bought something like 10,000 units of deworming. You know what deworming is, right? There's a parasite inside every children because they eat all these vegetables. So we bought 10,000 units, that's $10,000 of deworming pills. And so in order to do that, I'm having all these meetings, not all the time, but regular meetings. So it did take away uh, time from ministry because if she has five sponsor, she has to have a meeting with five sponsors. So it will take away. Um, uh, in the context of patron-client relationship, social anthropology, it was dyadic and asymmetrical. Of course, you know, it hasn't really turned into personal yet. And she hasn't really returned anything back yet. And it wasn't even voluntary because I kind of insist, right? And duration. So all this, some of it still apply, but what was the major thing that it accentuated the most uh, key points of the patron client dynamic cup and a relationship was that it was dyadic. It was between Bopar and me. It hasn't reached Bopar's children yet. I have not had connection with, you know, other kids in the orphanage, not yet. It's only through Bopar. So it was very dyadic and it was very asymmetrical because I came with money. I came with, you know, power and it, you know I'm the one who's providing so it's very it wasn't horizontal yet it was very vertical uh, interesting huh so that I start out 2007 as a cup as sponsor and then something interesting happened I had to play a role of a father why well because uh COP graduates and the government starts saying that, oh, if you're 18 and 19, you cannot stay in orphanages. So government was already uh, stay, try to stay away from unhealthy orphanages because a, a lot of things could happen. There were a lot of issues with sexual abuse and then, you know, things like that. So uh, Bopar asked, uh, can you, or actually not Bopar, Jenny, <laughs> Jenny said, hey, you're living with uh, student housing. At the time, I was living with uh, student center number three. I thought it was two. Uh, I was, uh, hmm. Oh, OK. So I was living with uh, New Life Church. Pastor Tung Bek Hong's, uh, and I was running a student center uh, with the uh, with the uh, New Life Church. And my wife says, "Honey, let them run by itself. You move and get a house right there. Start house of peace next to PC Market." a little bit away from the uh, southwest of Turturpong, 
Okay, so third third bone should be way up there, and then get a new place, and uh, start a student center. Start living with 18 or 17, 15, 16, 17, 18. I don't know how many uh, COP kids who graduated or too old to stay. Okay, do we make a lot of mistakes? A lot of mistakes, but we still need to do it. Jenny said, do it. And so this is my 2013, uh, eight years ago, uh, they live next flat. So we rent the two flat together uh, from 2011 to July, September, 2011, three years to July 26, 2014. So this is the my Facebook entry of August 17, 2013. So, wow. And we would actually worship together um, often. And we share meals, major meals together often. And so that was wonderful. Now, me as a cop, as a father, there was wonderful positive things and also negative things. What was a positive thing? What? It was very intimate. Although we only lived, you know, a maximum at the time, maybe four months, five months. So it wasn't 12 years, like 12 months a year. It was still only like maybe five months at max. But when we are there, we could have intimate relationship, then building relationship. So no longer Bopar plays the role. I had a direct connection with the children that I was living with. It was very intimate. It was very personal. That was very good. And because we live and see each other 24 seven, it was authentic discipleship. It wasn't seeing them once a week at a college group or high school group, no. Then, you know, you could fake it. You could act like spiritual and you don't really get to uh, see who they are. So it was authentic discipleship. That was fantastic. That's the, the best part of living together. And then I could teach them by life example. Also me too that I need to be careful how, we how I live, right? <laughs> I cannot, you know, get drunk and act stupid in front of these children. No, it's a, you're teaching by life example. And then I begin to deal with their real issues, their family issues, their, you know, father and mother issues. And, and there's a lot of abuse of father. And, I mean, they don't even live with them. And yet they cause so much heartache, you know? So I got to really learn um, about their real issues and, and really live on understand and their cultural barriers have been broken and I get to live with them. And so that was fantastic. That was the best part of positive aspect of living together and play the role of father to smaller number. You know, COP before was I sponsor 82 kids. So as a sponsor, I provide money, provide for the uniform for 82 kids. But now, I'm forced to play role of a more intimate father, no older relationship problem. And so uh, in that setting, now I have a file that is more personal, right? So now I have where they're from, little personal history, how many brothers and sisters, brief about their family history, where they're from, right? And then, oh, okay, he's from where? Oh, oh, he's from formerly from this father, another. Oh, he's sibling to this. Oh, she's so smart. And I say, oh, she's so smart. She wants to be a doctor. Let's send her to the best university. And then, you know, because know who she is and her English is excellent. And we're going to send her to after graduating from our center, we're going to send her to this other center in the run by Korean missionaries because they do excellent training. So it was very intimate. Right, And that was wonderful because now I know who they are, how I could help more practical closely. But what was the negative aspect of living together? It was too close for comfort. <laughs> it was like, you have to see them 24 seven. It was not easy. You try it, right? Live with some people within the same you know, house, 
next to, oh, this was a separate house, but still next to each other. You know, they know, you go in and out, and they come and use all your equipment, your guitar, your break your guitar, and break your bongo, break your zimbe, break, use your badminton and break. I mean, it's all gone. I come, hey, where's my pen? You know, <laughs> it's like, they don't steal. They just, they're orphans. They don't sense of me and mine. It's, it's all theirs, right? So very, very, very something that I need to also learn, right? And also I'm responsible not only for, you know, being responsible for 82 uniform is one thing, but being responsible for everything about them from chopstick to desk, to a toilet going break, breaking and now being responsible for bathroom door breaking, uh, the mosquito the mosquito net and from A to Z, everything about them I need are responsible. That was just too much responsibility. And it was bigger financial burden. Right? Although it's less in number, because now my wife wants to have a party. And every time she said, let's have a party. Wow. Every meal was like $100. We have to buy meat, soda, you know, pizza, <laughs> ordering uh, uh, pizza for 20. So there's no way we're going to do pizza party for 82 kids. No, it will cost $300. But, oh, it's only 15, let's have a pizza party, you know, just casually. My wife said, oh, let's say order pizza, that's $100. I mean, this is, you know, a uh, long time ago, still costs $100, right? Because my wife always ordered the best pizza, combination supreme, right? And with Coca-Cola, with, um, Buffalo wings, chicken wings was too costly. And also because now I act as a father, there was a potential capture possibility. Yeah, I could be super gop. And, and then the greatest temptation was for me to decide what they need to become. Like, oh, you should be a pastor. Oh, you should be a businessman. Or well, you should see, I don't have that power. I'm not God. I'm just cop. But I could act like God and say, oh, you know, I see that you're good at this. So you should be an engineer. Or you should be a designer. Or you should, you know, who are you? See, that's the temptation of a cop acting like God. Not good. What about Ur as a child? What about the, those guys who were part of that community. Same thing. There's always positive and there's always negative. Right? It's never all, all positive. If it's all, always positive, you probably join the cult. <laughs> right? Get out of it. There's always positive, there's always negative. You just gotta balance it. And you gotta know the difference. Well, for them, uh, for a brother N or, you know, sister V, who live with us, it was intimate relationship. They loved it. Wow, they get to know Pastor O, right? I get to see him 24 seven. Usually it was once a week or once a month, but now, well, as long as they're in five months, I get to see him every single day. Isn't that great? Great. And also, wow, learning by example, how he treats his wife and how he treats them and how he provides and, and worries about the different size chopstick and wow, he provides the same kind of furniture that he has, that he provides and he has worry about book. So he put a bookcase and put all the books. Or he worries about our the culture. So put expensive painting, you know, on each floor and, and same painting, call to see us painting he has, he provide for us. Very equal and very loving. Oh, that's good. And their sense of security. I'll be kicked out because they were told to move out. The government said kicked out of the orphanage. Where do I go? Well, he says that when you graduate, I'll send you through college. And all of the people who went there, whoever made it into college, we send them through college. It's a lot of security. That's very, very good thing for, it's just a standard thing, but for orphans, there was not 
luxury. And so they now live that. That was positive. What was the negative? For them also, too close to comfort. You know, I get to see them. They're all their mistakes and all their problems. And, you know, when Ha ah, gets angry and shouting and fighting and, and you know, I don't want to show that side of me to Pastor O, but now, you know, you cannot lie when you live with somebody 24 seven. Your, your true self shows too close to comfort. The negative side also was false security based on false identity. Example, I'm not your father. You know, actually, they really want me to come and said, Pastor O, can you be my father? I said, no, I cannot. I, I have a hard time being father to my own children. I got three and I adopted two, you know, not adoption, but we live with these guys for seven, eight years. So I had five kids that I'm not even good father to them. You know, I don't spend time with them. I don't, so I said, when, and then, but there's a false sense of security. Like, oh, I live with him. So he's going to provide for me rest of my life. No, no, I cannot be your father. It's a false sense of identity. Personal dependence may set in person to person because they know, oh, I'm sure he'll take care of me. No, I'm just, I'm a patron. I'm a cop playing the role as a father, but I'm not your father. See, I have to make it very clear from the very beginning. Otherwise, I'm going to give them false sense of security. I don't want to be their God. <laughs> I'm only their cop. So I said, no, you should trust God, not trust me. I, you know, Actually, honestly, this Center of Peace or House of Peace is one of the seven projects that I'm doing. And I want to make that very clear. Yes, I provide security. Yes, I'll provide for them. Yes, I'll play the very good cop as a patron. I'll do my part. But I don't want the false sense of identity to set it up. See, then it's personal dependency. I don't want them to personally depend on me. So... In that role as a father, yeah, it's dyadic, yeah, it's asymmetrical, but more accentuated, more importantly, the whole personal enduring start coming in and reciprocity. I expect them from the 15 people that I live with, I, I expect something back from them in loyalty, in, in, in attitude of giving, gratitude. See, the 82 kids that I provide uniform, yeah, it's, it's a uniform, but when I meet with them, have pizza party, provide for them furniture, their chopsticks and their food, their rice, their, you know, and, pizza and all that and worship with them regularly, I expect different thing in return. So that was kicked in. And then I move on to patron scout, but I think this will be a good time to stop. But you see what I'm doing is, uh, I did my PhD in learning about Kapenur. Now I'm going back. And this is kind of a new thing for me. And I'm getting, I'm blessing myself. And wow, I've done crazy a lot of stuff that I forgot about. I forgot most of the stuff that I'm sharing. I had to go through my file. Wow, I spent $2,000 on vitamin. I, wow, I spent $10,000 on dewarming pills. And, and I, I forgot completely about that, right? But this is something that, that I go back and trace. And then maybe something that I could teach you if you are missionary, you know, and, but important, keep a paper trail. Don't throw away anything, keep all the paper trails so you could go back and learn. Please send me questions um, so that I could uh, address it, right? I didn't want to be interactive. I don't want to just be solo talking to myself. All right, see you at the next lecture then. Bye.